Welcome to Emmanuel Church of Intook. Stay tuned for this week's sermon. So I, uh, it's been a really busy week, obviously, and uh, really for tonight, I said, Lord, I don't know what you have in your heart, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an open book. We are ready to come and hear what you want to do. And even if that meant just lying on our face and worship and give thanks to the Lord all night, then, you know, I was fine with that also. But as I was just seeking the Lord and praying this afternoon, it pointed me to something very specific uh, something that I think is so extremely important for us to recognize and to deal with as believers. Um, and so I hope that tonight we will encounter God and understand really the, the reality and the importance of forgiveness. Forgiveness in the life of every single person. And so I want to propose tonight that forgiveness is really the basis of the gospel in many ways. Without forgiveness, there's no good news. Amen? You can go and tell someone, I want to tell you the good news. Jesus died. Why did he die? No, he just, you know, he died. He died so that we can be forgiven. The outflow, the effect, the reality of that is so that, so that those of us, all of us, who have been separated from God because of our sin, who were dead because of our transgressions, we can find forgiveness in Jesus. That's good news. Amen? Is that good news? Okay, tell your face. That's good news. Now you're actually talking out of your face to your face. Okay, tell your neighbor. Good news. In Jesus, we can be forgiven. Hallelujah. But now I want to say, in order to keep it, you must give it. Forgiveness is one of the few things. If you want to keep it, you have to give it away. What do I mean by that? Well, we're going to get into it a little bit tonight. Um, the Lord actually just said to me, Matthew 18, and I knew what he was going to, you know, what, what was on his heart for us for tonight. And I would encourage you to turn with me to Matthew 18. And uh, we're actually going to read not only one or two verses. We're going to read quite a few portions, longer portions of Scripture tonight. It will be beneficial to you if you read it in your own Bible so you can come back to that and make a deeper study of it. Whenever we teach, whenever we preach, it's necessary that we don't just take it and then run, but we must also go and study it for ourselves and, uh, and, and let the Holy Spirit continue the work you know, of, of teaching us. He's the Spirit of truth. But I want to start actually a little bit before the passage that I want to get into. So we're going to start in Matthew 18, verse 15. And we're going to read about the situation or the dealing with, if you like, sin in the church. No amens there. Okay, here we go. Matthew 18, from verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two or three agree on earth about everything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So Jesus is giving this lesson to his followers while he's still on earth. Right? This is before the church was born. You understand what I mean by that? This was before the, the, the believers called themselves the church. And in anticipation of some of the challenges that the church would face, Jesus is giving them this teaching. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. <laughs> What's interesting is that Jesus is only recorded using the word ecclesia, the word church, twice. In all of the Bible, in all four Gospels, the word Ecclesia, Jesus only says that word two times. The one time, the first time is in Matthew 16, where he says, 
Behold, this is, you are Peter, but upon this rock, upon this proclamation, this confession, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. That's the first time that Jesus speaks about the church. The second time is here. Two chapters further down in Matthew 18, and he's talking about the church in the context of sin and discipline and repentance or unrepentant hearts. And, um, and he's really teaching us that sin needs to be dealt with. He's really saying to us that, you know, in, in, in this, we, we, have to, we, have to be, we have to be diligent and we have to be serious, even as those who are already in the church, especially as those in the church, to deal correctly with offenses, with transgression in the church. And so he gives sort of these steps, if you want. He says that first of all, step number one is you want to deal with these things privately. If someone, if a brother or sister in Christ has offended, has sinned against you, you go and talk to them privately. I want to say something about posting it on social media, but I'm not even going to go there. You know, when we sometimes say, hmm, these so-called Christians, you know, on your status, and everyone's like, ooh, I wonder what happened there. Sounds juicy. Hmm. Go to them in person. You know, it, it requires a certain measure of humility. It requires a certain measure of love and of grace because we're going in order to deal with this thing. We're not going in order to accuse them. We're not going to our brother or sister in order to tell them, look, you owe me because you did this and this and this. I don't know if it's clear. The heart is to be reconciled. The heart is for this, for this situation to be dealt with so that the church can maintain the unity can continue to walk together in love. So, but if, if the private conversation does not work, then he says, well, then you must, step two is bring witnesses. And here you can just think about this reality of how sometimes the situation looks one way to you and looks different to someone else. And sometimes we need someone to mediate for us, to just be there, to be a witness. Sometimes... The reality is sometimes a, bu- a brother or a sister, or even us, we don't want to repent. We don't want to admit that this has been a fault that we have made. And so there's a place where we then call, call a, someone else to be impartial, but to be there as a witness. Step three, if that still hasn't worked, you know, now it's sort of the situation has escalated quite a bit. Because now, tell it to the church. Now it becomes a situation where Jesus says, well, you actually have to bring this thing before the body so that together we can recognize and see this, pray, maybe call this person to repentance. But if at that point there still is no repentance, then there's this very drastic and and very, you know, it's almost a scary sort of act of putting someone out of the church what has been called excommunication, I guess. And, and the thing is, was Jesus gives the body authority in this regard to act in the best interest of both the church and the gospel. Sometimes the gospel message is tainted. It gets a bad reputation because Christians do not deal with sin accordingly. We preach a message where there is forgiveness of sins, where Jesus died in order to set us free. But then if someone continues in sin and continues abusing other people or, you know, there's some sort of whatever, transgression, some sort of a sin, I mean, you can color it in for yourself. But now if we don't deal with it, In the eyes of the world, they just say, well, this is just another club. This is no different than any other gathering of people. They say that they preach this gospel, but obviously they don't apply it in their own lives. And so in that sense, there really is, it's, it's, the process is, is, is backed and it's, it's motivated with grace and forgiveness and this desire to reconcile. But there's also, there's also a very serious uh, gravity and, and, and something that I think we have to take seriously when it comes to dealing with sin as the body, as the church. 
And this reality of excommunication is something that we should not take lightly. And at the same time, we must consider how serious that unrepentant sin, unrepented sin, is to the Lord. And as the church, we are not called to preach a message of compromise. It's not a message that says, you know, come to Jesus and uh, you can continue living your life. And the only thing is now you can ask for forgiveness every night. You know, we always used to be there. Is it just me? We, you know, at the, end of the, at the end of your prayer, you know, at the end of the night, you say, and Lord, please forgive me for all my sins. Amen. And tomorrow, you know, you just do it all again. Some of us might still be there. I want, I want us to just, just, this is sort of where Jesus starts the conversation. And, and, and he says that we must preach a message of repentance and forgiveness of sin. We must confront that which is wrong in love, in truth, so that there can be reconciliation, so that we can find forgiveness before God. Amen? Amen? So it's interesting that from there, the conversation now takes a little bit of a turn. And, and in some ways, it might seem contradicting even. Jesus has just said there must be this reconciliation. If it's not possible, if there's no repentance, then this person must be to you like a tax collector. Like a stranger, you must put them out of your fellowship. Now we pick it up in verse 21. Peter, gotta love Peter. He's always ready just to, you know, jump in. He comes and he says to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As, as many as seven times. He's thinking he's sort of putting it a bit high, you know. <laughs> Jesus said to him, I, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. So hold on, hold on, hold on. You just said we need to excommunicate this person, but now you're saying we must forgive. How does this work? How do these things go together? Well, before we continue reading, because now we're getting into it, there's a place where we have to understand that we must deal with a sin, but our hearts has to be clean before God. So even if there is an unrepented sin that has been dealt against us, and even if there are consequences in the church towards that person, that does not give you and me the right to bear a grudge against that person. And now Jesus will tell a parable to just reveal to us the gravity, the reality of how important forgiveness is before God. Verse 23 and onwards I'm going to read this whole parable together. I cannot say it better than Jesus. Never. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So that servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. And I wish the story ended there. <laughs> but when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. When his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, 
his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This this parable is considered by many to be one of the most confrontational and shocking parables that Jesus told. Bible teachers and theologians have wrestled over this for centuries. Especially this last part, handing him over to the jailers and that sort of thing. But I want, to, I want us first to notice that this first servant, the one that the story is actually about, having been forgiven much, he refused to forgive the little that was owed to him. I know that when it comes to talents and denarii, we don't necessarily have an idea. A talent is a weight of money. It's so much money they had to weigh it. <laughs> and one talent is about what a normal worker would earn in 20 years. Okay, this guy owed 10,000 talents. I think if we all put everything we owned together, we would still not even get close to 10,000 talents. This, this debt was enormous. In contrast, what the second servant owed, a hundred denarii, was kind of a denarii is like, you know, a minimum wage for a day. So it's kind of like, you know, maybe it's like a thousand dollars versus ten million dollars or a hundred million dollars. This servant was forgiven so much, but he refused to forgive even the little that was owed to him. And forgiveness is one of those things. You have to see it like this. The Bible says that we love because he loved us first. We, we, we love in response to his love. The same thing applies when it comes to forgiveness. We forgive because we have been forgiven. And like this servant, what we have been forgiven of is much. It's a lot. Each one of us, if we have come before God, if we have received forgiveness of our sin, that is an enormous debt that has been forgiven to us. So, so for us then, not to forgive someone else, and I want to say it like this, it's, it's almost unimaginable. But the mercy experienced by this first servant did not translate into mercy towards his fellow servant. It's a shocking thing. How can this guy, having just been forgiven so much, walk out of that place free from debt and start choking someone else about some little money that he is owed? Putting that person in jail, insisting, you must pay me what you owe me. I want you to realize that if the master had not forgiven him the first time, remember his command, take this servant, sell him into slavery, take his wife, sell her, take his children, sell them, take all of his possessions, everything in this world that he owns. This person is about to become someone's property, him and everything that he holds dear. And of that debt, of that reality, he is forgiven. It's an amazing act of mercy that the master shows him. He deserved that sentence. But instead, the master, the master had pity on him and forgave him. And this is how God forgives you and me. This is the, this is the good news of the good news. <laughs> it is that though we owe God so much, his forgiveness towards us is truly amazing. I think that's reason for a moment just to say, well, God, thank you. Thank you for that forgiveness, Lord. But this forgiveness, as amazing as it is, it is conditional. If we want to keep our forgiveness, we must also forgive others. Isn't that so? And, and you might remember how even after Jesus taught his disciples to pray after the Lord's Prayer, out of all the things that he said, he then goes on to talk about how if, if you forgive others, your Father in heaven can also forgive you. But if you do not forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. So it's not an isolated idea. It's something that Jesus actually spoke about quite a bit. But I want us to really, I want us really to, to, to sort of come to the landing of this, of this parable. The story ends 
with this servant being in a worse condition than he would have been if he had just been sold into slavery. For him to be sold with his wife and his family and so forth, is, it's a terrible thing. But now instead of that, instead of slavery, he is delivered to the jailers. Now the Greek word here, and this is why I say to you that theologians have wrestled over this. <laughs> the Greek word used here does not simply mean prison guards. It means the literal translation is tormentors or torturers. I don't know if you know the idea of an inquisitor. The Inquisition was a time in the dark, dark time in the history of the church where in the name of God, people were tortured. They would literally torture confessions out of people. And so the picture here is how this man, instead of becoming someone's slave, he is put in jail. Now think about this. He must go into this jail and be tormented until he can repay a debt that he could never repay to begin with. A hopeless, helpless, painful, torturous, that words cannot describe what this servant is now going to experience. And, and the shock of this, the shock is even surpassed by Jesus' conclusion because he ends the parable by then turning to us and saying, so also my father, my heavenly father, so he will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother out of your heart. Can someone say fear of God? <laughs> fear of God. Now this is not, this is not to scare you, but I, I really think that we must consider the implications here. Jesus is talking to people who have already experienced the master's forgiveness. He's talking to us as believers. We struggle with the idea that as Christians, we still experience hardship. Some of us, we, we, we were taught a gospel of come to Jesus and all your problems will go away. As recently as last week, a brother came to me and said, you know, I'm trying to make sense of this, but how can someone who's a Christian still experience the devil's attacks in his life? I thought I left all of that behind. Why does the devil still have my number? I deleted that contact. I unfriended him a long time ago. But still, still I experience the attacks of the devil. And I, and I think, you know, we struggle with this idea. Even that as Christians, we still experience demonic oppression. I don't want to go too deep into that, but I, I want to say that even though we want to believe we are free indeed and thus safely outside the reach of the devil, it's clear that we have the ability to bring ourselves under the Lord's judgment through something like unforgiveness. Who are the tormentors? Who are the torturers? Now, I don't want you to get the wrong picture. I don't want to propose tonight that God is going to send a demon to torment you. I do think, however, that the enemy is an expert when it comes to legal rights. And that when you and I find ourselves in a place where we are directly in disobedience against a very clear command in God's scripture, that we open the door for the enemy to come and to attack us in our lives. And how that attack looks, you know, we don't even have to go into that. Unforgiveness is one of those things that opens the door to those that Jesus calls tormentors we recently spoke about the war in the spirit and the reality of the spiritual battles that we face and i want to say when it comes to unforgiveness this is like deliverance 101 this is the most basic this is some of the most elemental entry level but common very common ways in which the devil gains access into our lives it's through the sin of unforgiveness Now tonight, I don't want you to mishear what I'm saying. There's a reason why we feel the way that we feel towards that brother who sinned against us or that sister 
or that parent or that stranger. There's a reason because we we have been hurt in this process. And by talking about this, I am in no way trying to diminish or make less the reality of what we have experienced. I think we can all agree that we have, we have been hurt in our lives. We have been hurt even by Christians. Can you say, yeah, that's me? A Christian brother, Christian sister has offended, has hurt me. And sometimes we feel that if we were to forgive that person, we would almost justify that deed of what they had done to me. As if we would be saying, well, it's actually fine. What they did, it's actually fine. And I would remind you that while Jesus was on that cross, and while he was bleeding for our sin, he didn't say, ach, it's fine. You know, it's not so bad. Our transgression cost him his life. He paid with his blood. But still he said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't understand the gravity of what they are doing. They don't have the full picture. So I want to just pause for a moment and I, and I want us to consider in our own lives. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we, it's like we wake up and it feels like there's someone here in my house that shouldn't be here. And we wonder, how did this person gain access? <laughs> how did the devil gain access into my life? But there is one door that is very obvious, and that is the door of unforgiveness. And I believe that God is calling us tonight to deal with that. Now, I, want to, I want to continue a little bit to see really what, what God is talking about, what Jesus refers to when he says, you must forgive out of your heart. Because there's a reality of our hearts that plays into this as believers, as Christians, that we have to understand. Paul picks up on this in the condition of our hearts and he shows that how as believers, through these kinds of things, through the attitude of our hearts, never mind the tormentors, the Holy Spirit, the one we actually want to live in our lives, we can grieve him. We can grieve the Holy Spirit through the condition of our hearts. In Ephesians 4, verse 30 to 32, Paul writes the following. He says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. See, that's what I mean. It's always reaction. In Christ, we have been forgiven. Therefore, we must also forgive each other. But I want to, I want to th ponder for a moment this ability for you and for me, flesh, mere human, mortal, temporary beings. Imagine that we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. God the Holy Spirit. Imagine the one who was there at creation. Imagine the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Imagine the spirit of power, the spirit of truth, the one who convicts the world of sin. God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. He knows all things. Imagine that you and I can grieve him. This is a word that's difficult for us to consider and to understand. How can we grieve the Holy Spirit? That's another shocking thing, I think, that we read in the Bible tonight. A lot of shockers tonight, I mean. And I'm not going to get into it, but if you, if you read the few verses before verse 30, Paul mentions four offenses, four kind of sins that in this context he shows that, that this results in grieving the Holy Spirit. In verse 25, he talks about lying. He talks about lying. 
in verse 26, he starts talking about anger. He says, in your anger, you should not sin. In verse 28, he talks about stealing. And in verse 29, he talks, he says, corrupting talk, the kinds of things that we speak with our mouths. You know, you would think you might grieve the Holy Spirit with, uh, you know, sexual immorality. You might grieve the Holy Spirit by murdering someone. You know, it's, it's not even, it's not even there. It's, it's things that in our minds might not even be so serious. You know, a little white lie here and there. Who does not become angry? No one was lifting their hands. Online people, no one lifted their hands. Just to, you know, stealing, obviously. We know this is a very, this is a serious thing. But, but he even would say under this topic of anger, there's, there's a specific warning that we should not miss. He says in, in, in verse 27, we should give no opportunity to the devil in our anger. So we must realize that these things, it speaks about things that in our minds are not serious sins, but there's a spiritual reality to everything that we do. And if in our anger we sin, there's an opportunity for the devil. I think one translation says, do not give a foothold to the devil. Right? Now, by using the word grieve, It shows that this passage is not simply dealing with transgressing the law. It's it's not just breaking the Lord's commandments. By saying you grieve the Spirit, God is making it very personal. He's making it personal. If you don't know, God desires a relationship with you. And the condition of our hearts is something that the Holy Spirit is personally invested in. I want to say it like this. The Holy Spirit dwells inside every born again believer. And he is actively working inside us to transform us from the inside out. He's, he's working to make us more like Jesus. Think about the fruit of the Spirit. Think about how the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and brings us to a place of repentance. Think about the work of sanctification that the Holy Spirit is always working in our lives in order that we would more accurately reflect Jesus on the earth. That's what the Spirit is doing inside each one of us. And that is a personal work. When he talks about these external sins, he shows that this is a reflection of a deeper problem, the condition of our hearts. The appeal here is not stop sinning. He didn't say, you know, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, therefore stop sinning. What does he say? Maybe we can have verse 31 on there again. Verse 31 and then 32. What is the answer? What is the solution? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Who of you desires to be a tender-hearted child of God? (laughs) You know, sometimes I feel like we want to be all, yeah, power, fire of God, you know, cast out the demons, miracles, signs and wonders. And miss that those, those things flows out of the vessel that the Holy Spirit inhabits. But the same Spirit that brings forth signs and wonders and miracles is the same Spirit that wants to work inside of us. That our hearts would be kind and tender-hearted. That we would be able to walk in forgiveness. Which means not just receiving it 
but freely giving it because in Christ we have been forgiven. Forgive one another as you have been forgiven. That's what I have. That's what the Lord gave me. And tonight, I believe that God really wants to do a work in our hearts. There's a place, and I think we, we, we must repent from, from sin in a general sense. We must never be ashamed to proclaim this message by which we confront those things that are wrong in our lives. It's not okay if you're a Christian to continue living in a sexually immoral way. It's not okay as a Christian to steal or to lie. There, the grace of God is not a license to just continue living in sinful ways. Those things we must confront. If we are going to be the church that God is building, we must also then, you know, speak the truth in love. But there's a place we must be able to deal with deal with our hearts in the presence of God.